other. So hello friends. So today as a snippet series, I'll be doing this small brief uh, topic focus in cardiac arrest. So it's a very brief component. So I'm sure all the intensivists who are hearing to this would have done all the components that are there in but in this particular focus in cardiac arrest. There's nothing uniquely different, but it is systematizing the way that we do ultrasound when someone has had a cardiac arrest. So that's all it's all about. But one take home is uh, to look into whether the compressions are impeding the LBOT outflow is something that you can ascertain by doing focus in cardiac arrest, which are shown to be important. So that is the quintessence of this topic. So when we think of principles that govern the ultrasound in cardiac arrest, so generally, when there is a cardiac arrest, there are three important components uh, that will keep happening in a patient, which is, of course, the CPR aspect. Then there would be defibrillation sort of a dimension. And there is this uh, phase where you would be administering drugs. So throughout this, there can be some sort of a interruptions that you would anticipate. And where does focus fit whilst all this is happening is what we would be looking at. So one thing that we need to bear in mind is during any of this CPR, AED or adrenaline, whenever you are embarking on doing this ultrasound, there should not be interruption to the CPR con aspect. So obviously the CPR has to be happening and no point of time you should say stop the CPR because I need to do focus. So that should not happen. That is something you need to understand. And another important aspect is the team leader who is overseeing the CPR should not be doing ultrasound. So ultrasound should be done by an by any personnel who is proficient, of course, to do it, but not necessarily is a uh, team leader of that whole CPR sort of a scenario that is happening. So, so the team leader should be governing and guiding the whole aspects of CPR, and there should be as another person who will be doing this ultrasound focus. So when we talk about this, so this is the sort of a very templating they have given as to how one should be conducting. So the view which is very friendly, which every intensive should put the probe is always at the sub -sifoid. So it is the sub view is the most preferred, most ideal. And that is what will give you juice for the money. Uh, so the first window you would look is sub -sifoid. And whilst compression is happening, then you can move this to the apical. So that is the second part you have to see. The third is you go into the suprasternal of the pulmonary view. The reason is to look for pulmonary embolism. So you have to look at three on both sides to look at possible massive thrombus when they have. So they would you could visualize thrombus in the one of the right or left pulmonary artery. So the main pulmonary artery. You can visualize from this uh, pulmonary window what we call three. And the fourth is to look into abdomen, to look into any free fluid or any abdominal cause. So basically when we talk about focus in cardiac arrest, they even stretch to a point, which I'm not covering in this video, which is, I feel is a little superfluous. They say even you have to look at optic nerve sheet diameter to see if there is intracranial bleed, TCD. I think that is a little stretch of, overstretch of an imagination. Here we will just focus on the cardiac component, lung component, and at best the abdomen aspect, if there is a trauma situation. So just remember this figure, sub is the first, then go to apical, then go to the pulmonary view to look at any pulmonary thrombus. And fourth one, you look into paracolics or into the abdominal to see if there is any free fluid. So if you remember this, that should be good enough. So this is the sub view. You will, you will see a picture of the heart, which is nicely sleeping like this with a LV, RV, and LA, and RA. So, so this, would, this is the best view that you should look at to look at any reversible causes tamponade. So if you look at this, so you have a patient with a pericardial effusion here with a tamponade. And this is the sub view where you have a LV, RV, LA and RV. And here you see the collapse of the LA happening with the pericardial effusion and there is a compression. So this is a cardiac tamponade you would see in the sub view. And most important, I think the take home from this particular snippet is mainly it is done, the focus in cardiac arrest to ensure that the compressions is not causing compression of the NVOT. Because when you're doing compression and releasing, when you do a recoil, you are expecting the blood from the LV to flow into the LVOT. So if you are compressing to a point where you are completely impeding and not allowing the sort of a relaxation and, imp and impeding the flow into the uh, LVOT, so that may not help you get the cardiac output. So it, 
I think this if this is focused upon why it's because it is said up to 30%, 30 to 32% of the time, the LVOT flow is impeded by our CPR. That is something that you have to bear in mind. And that is the first thing you can look in sub -sepoid also. On, and the apical, of course, you can see. And uh, so obviously the chest compression, you would position uh, just above the CP sternum. So when you're doing a sub pay attention if the LVOT outflow is being impeded. So the, there are a few steps that are uh, sort of uh, indicated. The first one is to see whether the arrest, confirm arrest, because it is said that many a times that you may have asystole, but there can be some cardiac activity. So the first step, when you do a sub -C point, obviously you look for any causes. The first step is to see whether there is any cardiac activity or no cardiac activity. So confirm arrest, whether heart is standstill or whether there is some sort of a cardiac activity. The first step is, to confirm. So they have put some systematization to this process. First is confirm arrest. Second is confirm effectiveness of CPR and make sure there is no impeding of the blood flow into the LBOT. That is the second aspect. So first one is confirm there is a no cardiac contractility or whether there is cardiac. Second is effectiveness, whether the compressions are good enough and whether there is no enough time is allowed for the blood, for the forward flow of the blood and there is no impeding of the LBOT outflow. That's the second step. The third step, which is most crucial for all of us, is to look at any urgent interventions. In fact, the, the, the third step, they say, look for lung sliding signs. I'll just show this. I think this video should work. So look at the lung sliding. Whether there is lung sliding or whether there is no lung sliding, because if there is no lung sliding, immediate intervention of some nature would be needed, which is putting in an underwater steel drain or, or correcting the pneumothorax by the needle thoracotomy, so on and so forth. So the, the third step is immediately that AIDS intervention, look for lung sliding. And in third intervention, they say you can use that intervention to guide any axis. If you want to put immediate IV axis and if there is no IV axis, in the third step, they suggest that you can utilize that to do some sort of a venous cannulation. Then the fourth step, is to look for reversible causes. So obviously, when you have signs like this, where there is no lung siding, where there is pneumothorax, you have to do a decompression of some nature with either underwater seal or needle thoracostomy to decompress. So fourth step. So the first step is to look at whether cardiac standstill is there or some cardiac contractility is there. Second step is effectiveness of compression and make sure that LBOT outflow is happening. Third step is look for a lung sliding and do a corrective measure. And you can use third step for doing some sort of a vascular intervention. Fourth is to see whether there is a pneumothorax or reversible. Fourth is all the reversible causes, whether there is lung sliding sign. And if you have stratophere sign or a barcode sign, then you know there is a pneumothorax. But absent lung sliding, not always means pneumothorax. The differential diagnosis, the camp atelectasis, pleural additions, apnea, or pranicna. So these are some of the differentials. But if you have a sign like this with a stratophere on M mode, Obviously, intuitively, you know it is pneumothorax and you have to intervene. And of course, you look for lung point because there can be localized pneumothorax where you have a transition point where there is a lung sliding here, there is no lung sliding, which we call it as a lung point, which also tells you that there is a pneumothorax. So then, of course, then you have to look for other. So basically, we looked at tension pneumothorax in four T's. And second thing is you look at any tamponade. So if you have a echo like this with a cardiac tamponade, then obviously you need pericardiosynthesis to decompress and correct the obstructive shock. So, so that's the thing. And this is the case. Then you looked at tension pneumothorax. Then you looked at tamponade. Then you have to see hypovolemia. So you can look at H also. So if there is a collapsing IVC, and severely hypovolemic, you have to correct. So you have to use. So the fourth step is to look for all reversible causes, which is hypovolemia, tension pneumothorax, tamponade, and pandri thrombomorism. These are the only four things, because acidosis and all that we cannot see. So these are the four things. So this is a collapsible IBC. You have to correct with volume. And you can look at this, uh, where you have a indirect evidence that there is a possible pandri embolism because the RV is fully dilated, and uh, there is a strain on the LV, and there is a D sign that hand fell. So I'm sure you know all these features to look for uh, possible features indicating the possible P, because the, as you see, the RV is dilated. If the RV size is as big as LV, you know it is dilated. Or 
you have to do this pulmonary window to look for thrombus in the pay attention to this there is a thrombus here see this is the thrombus in the right pulmonary artery this is from the pulmonary window you are seeing a thrombus so that's why i said you first do the subsepoid then go to the apical view then you go to the pulmonary view if, if you are suspecting pe you will see a thrombus in the pulmonary artery either in the right so this is on the left pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery so you have to go on the right to look for right pulmonary window left pulmonary window to look into the left pulmonary artery so you will see a thrombus of this nature and so that is the fourth step fourth step we only look at hypovolemia tension pneumothorax tamponade and thromboembolism so we look at three t's and one h because other things obviously we can't fifth is immediate post rosc you have to look for any other features that has led to this cardiac arrest so obviously you look for any sort of a uh, rockets or comets that you have b lines so this suggests that there is alveolar edema as you see the, the spacing between the B lines is less than 3 millimeter. It's more of interstitial edema. And you will sometimes you have this sort of where the separation is more than 7 millimeter. It suggests more of uh, alveolar. This, the right one is interstitial edema. Second one is little lesser sort of a pulmonary edema. So look for B lines, post resuscitation phase. Mm -hmm. And along with it, while in post resuscitation phase, you look for any hepatization, whether there is any consolidation, whether there is atelectasis. So if you have something like this with a hyperechoic or hepatized lung, you know there is an underlying consolidation, which may have led to hypoxemia leading to cardiac arrest. So basically, you're looking post resuscitation, whether there was a pulmonary edema, whether it's a lot of B lines that has led to the cardiac arrest due to hypoxia, or whether it's a pneumonia led to whatever reason to cause cardiac arrest. Or you look at whether there is a massive pleural effusion, which is not a very uncommon cause for hypoxemia leading to arrest. And you can look at any pleural effusion. And you can measure the, and quantify the pleural fluid also uh, in ICU. So I'm sure you know the means to measure the distance. You can see in this video. Okay, so I've taken the measurement there. This is to just quantify how much pleural fluid is there. So quantifying pleural fusion, many of you might have learned, we use the Balik et al. We use 20 into the maximum sort of a septal difference that will give you the quantification of the pleural fluid. And if it is less than 70 millimeter, it is around 340 ml. So something. So basically you, you take the measurement and multiply it into 20 to measure the quantification to see if it is trainable to correct hypoxemia. So I think that's all it is about focus. So it is mainly to systematize your way of uh, assessing the causes for cardiac arrest. So the summarily, basically the step one is to see whether cardiac standstill is there or whether there is cardiac contractility. Second one is to effectiveness of chest compression and make sure that enough recoil is there that we are not impeding the LVOT outflow. And uh, uh, so third thing is to look at immediate intervention to see whether there is lung sliding sign and to do any vascular intervention. Fourth is to look at all reversible causes. We can only look at four reversible causes, which is hypoxemia uh, due to pneumothorax. So you look for uh, petrofear sign or you look for a lack of lung sliding sign. And then uh, you look for tamponade, you look for uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. Then you look for hypovolemia with IVC. So only four causes we can do. And fifth is look for post resuscitation problems like whether there is any consolidation, whether there is any pleural effusion, so on and so forth, or whether there is any pulmonary edema. So that's all, folks, it is there. And you can look into abdomen. So the extension of this, which they have taken as a stretch of imagination, is you have to look into TCD, you have to look into optic nerve sheet diameter to see if there is increase in ICP, or you have to look into the fast scan, quick fast scan in the abdomen to see whether there is a huge abdominal collection. So that's all it is in the focus. So don't get overwhelmed. Uh, it's a very simple thing, just systematization of this whole process. So the take-home message is the main goal of ultrasound in cardiac arrest is to look at the effectiveness of CPR. And as I said, up to 30% of the time, patient may have lack of cardiac output, but there'll be some cardiac contractility to ascertain that. And the third thing is to identify reversible causes. So thank you, friends. I request you all to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. And of course, you can visit my website to rehear to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you.